Our second reading is the text for today's message recorded in Romans chapter 10. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand now to honor the person and the work of Jesus as it's recorded for us in the Holy Gospel. Jesus reveals his divine nature and his power over creation. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed the crowd, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against it. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it's I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Eric, I don't think you could have picked a better song to, uh, to lead us into our message today, that here I am, send me, send me, just screams from Isaiah's lips as we listen to the epistle reading for today, that it is our job to go and preach. If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus, you can say he died for all. That's our job. That's my job. You pay me to do that, but it's your job as well. It's very much your job as well. Paul begins our text today beating that dead horse that righteousness is not by following the law or by our works, but it is by faith, that our faith is counted to us as his righteousness. 
Paul writes in verse 5, For Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commands shall live by them. But by keeping the law perfectly and thus becoming righteous is just so far beyond our human grasp. Only somebody who is self-righteous and a hypocrite would claim that they can do such a thing. See, God never really intended the law and keeping the law to be our route to righteousness. Sending Jesus was his plan from the very beginning to redeem and save us. That righteousness for us is based on faith. Faith in the right promise. And see, he says it's important that we confess and believe. Paul says that the right news is already in our mouths and in our hearts. It is something we know and believe. It's not just mere lip service. It's not something that we believe and don't talk about. It is something that we believe and we speak. What is in our hearts comes out of our mouths. And we confess that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. See, confessing that Jesus is Lord is the one to whom we submit. We acknowledge that he is the ruler of our lives, that his reign is this kingdom of God, the world put right. We submit to his lordship in our lives. We submit to his righteousness that he washes over us. Our faith is counted as this righteousness. And we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead. That he is indeed victorious over sin, death, and the power of the devil. He's victorious and he shares that victory with us. See, that first death does not get the final word because we believe in the resurrection. That that he shares a resurrection with us that one day we shall rise again. And a second death, that separation from God for eternity, doesn't stand a chance against the victory of Christ. This resurrection will be ours. And to believe in our hearts is to more than just have knowledge. It's more than a collection of information that we know and have memorized. But it's something that we believe in our hearts. Right, the biblical understanding of the heart is, the, is the, the heart and soul of who we are. And in Western thought, it's all about our minds and what we think, and that's the, the center of, of everything. But in biblical times, the heart was where it was at. And that was where the core of who you are resided. And this heart awakens by hearing the word of God and comes alive. And this awakened heart can't help but verbally confess what it is that it believes. Then there's this whole beautiful feet idea, which always sounded a bit strange to me. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? We can hear that resonating from the hymn that we just sang, here I am, send me, send me. And here is the need for the the great commission to go and make disciples, teaching and baptizing. And our way of doing that in this time and in this place is awakening hearts in every generation to the power of life in Christ. This awakened heart filled with belief, pouring out of our mouths the confession that we believe. And when we do that, could you imagine an entire community coming alive to the power of life in Christ? Paul is a bit of of an engineer here, and he's reverse engineering how it is that somebody comes to faith. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. And again, I I hear this, and like Isaiah, I want to say, here I am, send me, send me, send you. The Great Commission 
is not the pretty good suggestion. It's not the if you have a chance and it's convenient, or if you feel like it, that would be nice. And the Great Commission was given to me and given to you in equal portions. The mission. It is the focus of a disciple. The church is a group of people who are focused on this unified mission of creating more disciples. That's who we are at our core. We're not merely a group of people who gather together on Sunday to worship God. That's an important piece of who we are, but it is not the core of who we are. God has given you the task of making more disciples. And he does this through Paul by reverse engineering this process. The goal is the enlargement of the kingdom of God, that people would call on him. But first they have to believe in him, and first they have to hear of him, and first somebody has to be preaching to them, and first somebody has to be sent to preach to them. And those people have beautiful feet. Now, I imagine feet in biblical times were quite gross. Pretty disgusting. They were usually adorned by sandals, which were great for breathability, not so good for keeping the road debris out. And so they would be crusted with dirt and dust. And missionaries such as Paul, unless he was sailing across a sea, was traveling from place by foot. And the journey would result in blisters, calluses, and sores. Pretty far cry from the beautifully pedicured feet of today. And yet it's these feet, all used and abused by countless miles around the biblical world, that are called beautiful. This good news gospel word is not really a church word. It started off in biblical times of times in war. And there would be a herald that would see the battle is victorious. I need to let the people back home know that we have won, that they have no, nothing more to fear. And that herald would run back with this message of good news. We are safe. That's the, West, that's the message that we have today, this gospel. That we are heralds running away from the battle that has already been won to declare to the world good news. We are safe. Now, like a sight for sore eyes, those probably bloodied and sore, dusty and dirty, stinky feet would be beautiful indeed because of the message that was delivered was one of safety and security. See, we all have witnessed something phenomenal. We've seen through the, the words of Scripture, living and breathing, we've seen the cross. We've seen our Savior crucified. We've seen him buried. And we've seen him rise, victorious over sin, death, and the power of Satan. We have this good news that we have witnessed the victory battle. And it's our job to be heralds to go out and deliver this good news message with the world. But sometimes it's hard to share. There's three areas that really stand out to me as the main reasons why we don't do a good enough job sharing this gospel message. One would just simply be a lack of knowledge. Even if you've been a Christian for a short amount of time, you've heard this good news hundreds of times already. And yet somehow it can be difficult for our, to us to articulate just a 60-second conversation about our faith and, and what it means to be Christian and what, what Jesus has done and continues to do for us. Sometimes we just need to grow in that knowledge of what he's done and to think about how would we say that briefly, succinctly, and winsomely. And if it's not a lack of gospel knowledge, then perhaps it's fear. Right? Sometimes we can be paralyzed about how other people may respond to us. 
or how that may change the dynamics of our relationship with our neighbors if we share that faith? Will it be awkward afterwards? If we share it at work, will that reduce our chances of moving to the next level and and getting a raise or the new promotion? Or what if people marginalize us, dislike us, or mock us? And then, quite honestly, if it's not a lack of knowledge and it's not a, a, a lack of or, a, or a, an abundance of fear, this next one might be a little bit difficult to hear, but it's a lack of compassion. We lack compassion for the lost. Some of us just don't care that much about the lost. Now, we would never say that. We would never say that out loud, right? But do our lives reflect it? I had to think about that very, I had to think about that a lot this week. How many unchristian people do I connect with on a weekly basis? Not very many. Most of my friends are Christian. I work at a place where everybody's Christian. I meet together regularly with other Christians. And that's a good thing because we need one another to build each other up, to encourage and and equip and challenge and strengthen one another. But it's really hard to evangelize another Christian. (laughs) They're already safe. To help fight against these things, I spent some time this week with with three R's of salvation, I'm going to call it. Remind, reflect, and rejoice. Remind. Remind. It's safe to say that it's a good thing for us to remind one another that we've had a desperate need to be saved and we have been saved. Right? That's meaningful. We do that in confession and absolution. Remember, we, we, we remember that without the forgiveness of Christ, we would be lost. We would be separated from God for eternity. But he, out of an abundance of his love and grace and mercy, did not want to be separated from us. So he sent his one and only son to suffer and die to pay the price so that we could be with him forever. So that he could look at us and say, I forgive you. I've taken away your guilt, your shame, and given you the righteousness of my son. We need to remember that on a regular basis. So we need to be reminded. We need to reflect also. To reflect on on what does that salvation do for me for eternity. To reflect on what it means to be a forgiven child of God today. How does my life reflect the salvation that I have in my words and in my actions? And then when you reflect on that, it just flows into the third one. We rejoice. We celebrate. We grow in gratitude. That's why we we come together to worship. Not to to please God, but to receive his gifts and just respond in worship to him. And when we remind ourselves of salvation, when we reflect on its meaning and value and impact on us, when we rejoice to God for what he's given us, and those excuses start to melt away. And we remember how precious it is, this good news that we believe in our hearts that needs to come bubbling out of our mouths to those that we connect with in life. Today, you are being sent from here. Sent to your homes, to your schools, to your neighborhoods, to your places of work, to your communities. With this purpose, this mission, to share Jesus with somebody else. Oh, I don't know how to do that. But let me give you a tip. This is something that we've shared a few years ago, but it's, it's, a, it's an easy word to remember. Live out your faith. I want you to live as a disciple maker. Live. L-I-V-E. A great way to have a faith conversation with somebody else is to first ask them where they're starting from. So the L is to learn. 
learn all you can about their background, about why they believe what they believe today. Be genuinely curious about them. Learn about them and their view of God. Number two, the I, is to help them imagine what an ideal God would look like. And of course, you can lead and guide that conversation, but it should go somewhere around he's loving and he's gracious and he's forgiving and he's caring and he's good to provide and he's shelter and he's strong and all of these positive characteristics. Help that person imagine what kind of good God would be. And the V is verify. Verify those good qualities of God with them in the pages of Scripture. Show them the God that you are in love with. And the E is engage. Engage with them in everyday life. Show them that you have a care for who they are and what they're going through. And those moments will happen for you to have more and more conversations. And when they know that you have a genuine interest in their background, they become curious about yours. And you have that open door now to share. To share your faith story. To share why you are in love with God. That's that right news that's in your heart, that's coming out of your mouth. And let your family, your coworkers, your friends hear this right news. Right? We gather together on Sunday to worship God, to glimpse the glory of God, to hear the word of God, and to fellowship with one another, and to pray with one another, and then we scatter. Every single week, we scatter into different places, into different offices, into different neighborhoods, into different parts of a community and our city, and sometimes other countries. Every week we gather, and then we scatter. And we scatter doing this, preaching the word of God. And as we do that, well, the Holy Spirit does all the heavy lifting. He takes the words of God that come out of our mouth and places them and plants them. And sometimes those seeds we get to see grow beautifully and abundantly, and sometimes we see those seeds just stolen away. But our job is to scatter and preach. The Holy Spirit does the rest. May this bring you peace that passes all understanding in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.